Good evening and welcome to our slightly delayed start and to the 262 participants who've joined us for tonight's webinar and the viewers who are watching this podcast. MHPN wishes to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia upon which this webinar, our presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay our respects to the Elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the culture and the hopes of Indigenous Australia. Hello, I'm Catherine Boland and I'll be facilitating tonight's session. I'm a clinical psychologist with expertise in child and family, but not quite in the area that tonight's presentation is, which is methamphetamine use and working collaboratively to manage comorbid mental health and methamphetamine use. Thankfully, this webinar has been uh, provided by the support and funding provided by the New South Wales Ministry of Health and we thank them for that. There's some information there if you'd like some more information about the Ministry of Health. Tonight I'm joined by an expert panel and you can read more about them in detail on the information on the website. I'd like to introduce each of our panellists um, and tell you a little bit about their background. First of all, I'd like to introduce Associate Professor Adrian Dunlop. Adrian is one of those unique individuals that has expertise in both medicine and academia. He has a litany of awards and has been involved in addictions research and medicine for several decades. Adrian, you've done some other webinars on ICE. Can you tell us why it's such a particular topic of interest for you? I think there's no, uh, there's no doubt that we've heard a lot about it, uh, especially over the last year or two. Uh, interestingly, it was one of the first drugs I started to see patients with clinically going back into the early, mid-1990s. So um, some things have changed and, uh, and some haven't over the time, but certainly it's a patient group that I've seen over a long period of time. Right. Well, we're looking forward to tapping into your expertise. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Grant Sarah, who is a psychiatrist who too has an expertise and interest in the area of ICE. And Grant, you're conducting some studies on the impact of um, amphetamines and other stimulants. Can you tell us a little bit about the nature of your studies? Sure, look, I mean, I have a clinical role working with young people with psychosis and, and you know, a large portion of them have had ice problems, but um, I think it's one of the areas where large data sets and epidemiology can help shine a light on clinical problems um, because uh, so many young people who use ice also use uh, cannabis and so uh, we've been using New South Wales uh, data and uh, Australian population data to, to look at and try and untangle the effects of amphetamines and, and cannabis from each other. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely of interest and some of the um, uh, participants have already asked us some questions about young people, the use of ice and the comorbidities with other substances. So we'll be tapping into your expertise in, in that area also. All right, I'd, I'd li now like to introduce Dr Hester Wilson. Uh, Hester is a general practitioner who works at the Langdon Centre amongst other uh, incredible professional accomplishments in the area of addictions and she, as she's a specialist in addiction medicine. Uh, Hester, can you tell us a little bit about the work that you do in general practice? Uh, so I work in a general practice setting in metropolitan Sydney as well as in a specialist drug and alcohol setting. But from the primary care point of view, uh, my particular interest in terms of methamphetamine is the fact that we in general practice are seeing patients with methamphetamine issues. But quite often in the general practice setting, that's not what they present with. They'll present with other issues and it takes some, some digging on the part of the clinician to uh, actually work out the, the role that their um, drug use might be having. And it's an area in in, uh, that is quite important for us in general practice. We see 85% of the population in the year. Uh, we have relationships with our patients and this is a group of patients um, that we are seeing and maybe not picking up on. Yeah, I think that's such an important perspective and, and the real front line of presentation. Yeah. Um, all right, last but certainly not least, I'd like to welcome Professor Amanda Baker who is a clinical psychologist. Amanda, you're a senior research fellow working in the research area of substance use amongst many other things. Can you tell us a little bit about your um, research work? Yeah, so um, I work mainly in uh, clinical treatment outcome research. So um, over the years I've done some work on motivational interviewing and 
CBT with people who use methamphetamine and um, what I want to talk about tonight is how successful that can be and um, really hope you know, to increase people's confidence in that area because we've had a lot of success with that. That's absolutely great to hear and, and really segues well with some of our other expertise on the panel tonight. All right, I'd like to um, go through a couple of things to ensure that everyone has the most, uh, gains the most from the live pre webinar. So I'd like to all of you to consider the following ground rule, rules. First of all, to be respectful of other participants and panellists and behave as if this was a face-to-face -face activity. Please post your comments and questions for the panellists in the general chat box and we will be following along with those and trying to answer those where we can. If you need help with technical issues, and I know there have been a few, if you post in the technical help chat box, just be mindful that all the comments posted in the chat boxes can be seen by all the participants and the panellists, so try to keep those comments on topic. And it's fantastic to get your feedback. If that's all too distracting and you'd like to hide the chat, just click the small drop down arrow at the top of the chat box. Your feedback is also very important to us, so we'd really like you to complete the short exit survey which will appear as a pop-up when you exit the webinar. And the other thing is just to be mindful of self-care where if you're dealing with any of the issues that are raised tonight which we understand can be difficult and ensure that you get some um, support. This is not designed as a, a personal resource to help you but as a professional platform for a discussion. If you would like some support services or phone numbers, you can uh, access the resource document in your, on your platform for phone numbers of support services. So that in mind, I'd like to turn our attention to some of the learning outcomes for tonight's webinar. First of all, through an exploration of comorbid mental health and methamphetamine use, the webinars will provide you with an opportunity to recognise the clinical effects and harms related to methamphetamine use and comorbid mental health, to increase your skills and understanding of managing methamphetamine users and improve awareness of evidence-based interventions, and to identify strategies and to engage specialist services when treating someone using methamphetamine. Um, what we'd like to um, do now is turn over to Adrian, who's going to give us some information from an addiction medicine perspective. Great, thanks, Catherine. So um, you've seen the case, uh, and you know, essentially, uh, we're going to talk uh, about different elements of it. But um, a young man uh, in rural Australia who has had an escalating pattern of amphetamine use over a period of time, and I'm going to pick it up from the moment that uh, he's in the emergency department. So just thinking a little bit about how somebody like Andrew might be managed in the emergency department, um, and I understand the majority of you will probably be working in community-based settings, not in hospital settings, but I think it's important to have an understanding of what goes on. But the first thing I want to stress is um, a bad public health message. What happened on the ad that I'm sure everyone's seen um, run, uh, run last year about the young boy Smashing the uh, chair at the emergency department staff is not the most typical presentation for amphetamine use and is not what most hospital staff have to deal with, but they do have to deal with people from time to time presenting uh, in acutely agitated states. So just quickly to summarise, um, somebody who's methamphetamine intoxicated, what will they look like? Um, because it's a stimulant, their body's essentially overstimulated. So they won't be able to sit still. Um, if you do their vital signs, they'll all be elevated. Um, they'll often look sweaty and have dilated pupils. Um, and their mental state, there's a range of presentations. Um, Grant's going to talk to you a little bit more about um, some of these in particular, but a, along a spectrum um, of anxiety, agitation, paranoia, through to delusions, uh, magical thinking, hallucinations, and even psychosis. Uh, and sometimes this presents by people being socially withdrawn, so they're so paranoid they're, they're, they're not willing to engage uh, with anyone. And sometimes we'll be presenters and they're looking acutely agitated. So fortunately for um, 
emergency department staff being aware that people can present like this and need rapid sedation. There is a protocol that's been disseminated to all New South Wales hospitals. Not all hospitals are yet using this protocol, but there's uh, a strategy to get the information out there, so it's available on the New South Wales website. It's the Management of Acute Severe Behavioural Disturbance. Um, can, it can be used for other drugs other than um, amphetamine, could be used for alcohol, could be used for other reasons for amphetamine, with for intoxicated presentation. But essentially, it's to assess somebody, try to verbally de-escalate them. If they'll tolerate oral medication, then diazepam or lorazepam, are generally the, the first-line drugs of choice. Uh, if somebody won't uh, accept oral medication, then droperidol and a repeat dose of up to a, uh, two doses of, of 10 milligrams of droperidol are indicated. And the key issue uh, is not so much the medications, but it's having a structured response. So if somebody is acutely uh, agitated, there's a structured response. Emergency departments switch staff switch in a gear uh, as they would for other emergency presentations and have a, have a good acute um, response. In terms of the medical complications, there's a number of medical complications. Some of them are uncommon. Um, the more common ones are certainly injury related to their intoxication state, um, risk of um, hepatitis C in particular or hep B uh, if injecting, um, endocarditis for injecting drug users and then a range of cardiovascular uh, problems, uh, CNS or brain problems, hypothermia is a risk uh, and gastrointestinal problems are a risk too and they're some of the things that would be assessed in an acute setting. Um, the flowchart might be too small to see, but essentially it's saying, uh, and again this has been developed by Sydney LHD, uh, can, be, can be used by others though, uh, it's assessing somebody for signs of acute toxicity. If there's acute toxicity, you've got to screen and assess it, so any of those acute risks that I was just talking about. Um, if there's not, then uh, the management is to refer them to outpatient drug and alcohol services uh, and essentially counselling is the mainstay there. Uh, Amanda will be talking to you more about that so I won't talk to you too much about counselling uh, interventions. So who else might need to be involved um, in somebody's care presenting with this sort of presentation to an emergency department? Clearly uh, Andrew's got uh, um, some acute mental state problems and that's going to have to be followed up. We just talked about drug and alcohol aftercare, counselling being first line treatment uh, and the other thing that clearly is going to be, need to be managed managed is Andrew's social and family problems. I've put up the DASIS help number, that's a 24 hour a day, 7 day a week, 365 day a year number for health professionals to call, 1800 023 687 uh, and you're welcome to access that. So I'll stop there Catherine. Wonderful. Thanks, Adrian. That's an excellent perspective from the emergency department. I should have mentioned earlier that you, you can find the information about our case study in the resources folder and was also sent to you on registration. And so I'd like to now turn to, um, uh, to Dr Grant Sara, who's going to give us the perspective from a psychiatrist. Thanks very much, Catherine. Um, and look, I think the case history that was uh, provided is a very realistic one, and, and a scenario that you know, we certainly often see, and I'm sure many people on the on the um, uh, webinar tonight would recognise. Um, so the first thing I was going to uh, discuss was just that link between amphetamine and psychotic symptoms, and particularly hallucinations. Um, and that's been uh, amphetamines were first marketed in the 30s and the first reports of, of uh, psychosis you know, really followed on within a year or two but particularly from the 1950s there was quite a literature looking looking at this and a very interesting series of studies in the 60s and 70s of giving healthy volunteers high doses of, of uh, amphetamines to um, to uh, uh, and, and finding that you know for the majority it can induce psychosis if given enough um, and there's also a, a large body of research showing high rates of psychotic symptoms usually brief and transient but potentially going on to more enduring psychosis in recreational stimulant users um, and particularly associated with higher doses, higher frequency, intravenous use, use and also um, with the use of high potency forms like crystal methamphetamine or ice um, uh, as opposed to others. Probably one of the mechanisms, one of the reasons that amphetamines are such potent triggers of acute psychosis is um, you can see the, the picture there of um, uh, amphetamine compared to dopamine and amphetamine is 
a very strong analogue of dopamine, which is one of the brain's key uh, neurotransmitters involved in our reward systems, hence the pleasure. And there was a question uh, on, on the chat earlier from um, Vicky Fisher about wh you know, whether there's a relationship between amphetamine um, dependence and that kind of rush that we search for. And in some ways, you know, that relationship between with dopamine and the brain's reward systems is probably part of that. So one, with a situation like Andrew, one uh, diagnosis that will often come up is that idea of drug-induced psychosis. And I did want to make the point that that idea that there's two very distinct forms of psychosis, drug-induced psychosis, which is sort of benign, and other sorts of psychosis which are more serious, is, is probably not well supported by the evidence. Um, and certainly there's reason to be very cautious about a diagnosis of drug-induced psychosis. It's got poor reliability, it's a poor predictor of outcome, um, and a high proportion of people who uh, have, have a psychotic episode or even brief psychotic symptoms serious enough to bring them to hospital um, will go on to have other disorders. We did a study in New South Wales looking at more than 7,000 people with brief atypical or drug-induced psychosis and most of those were drug-induced. Um, and nearly half went on to have a later admission with a diagnosis of schizophrenia. So it's really critical not just to look at the, the individual episode in front of you but the person's broader risk factors and I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, um, just moving on to the next slide. Um, so instead of that very binary view, increasingly psychosis is seen as very much a continuum of disorders um, that uh, relate to brain development. Um, and where what's important to understand is, is the, the individual's combination of risk factors. Um, and typically there will be uh, genetic and family risk factors. Uh, uh, and some evidence of uh, early insult to the brain in its development in utero or in early childhood, uh, head injury or psychosocial trauma, um, and uh, evidence in childhood of learning and sensory and motor problems, um, and, and then psychosis emerging during that critical period of brain development in adolescence and substances being potentially a great trigger for that. So um, the, the view of psychosis, therefore, is a spectrum where up to about um, uh, 10 to 20 percent of the population might have a broad spectrum uh, of vulnerability to psychosis um, and uh, that, that brief psychotic symptoms are common in that, in that group. So Andrew is, by the fact that he's there, he's automatically in that higher risk group and so it's really critical to then understand what's his unique combination of risk factors. Um, the other thing that's important is that psychoses are more than just hallucinations and you know, while they're a, a classic and characteristic symptom, that, that psychoses have many dimensions and different diagnostic systems talk about four or five or even up to eight different dimensions. But the, the hallucinations and paranoia are what's typically called positive symptoms, um, but there's also other symptoms. So there's symptoms in a broader psychosis of drive, affecting drive and volition, um, symptoms of, of cognitive problems and symptoms of mood. And it's one of the challenges with methamphetamines is that the, the effect of methamphetamines can mimic and, and, and uh, uh, you know, appear to um, you know, cause all of those sorts of problems. So um, if we come back to Andrew, um, then really what are the implications of this for Andrew? So I think he needs careful assessment about the broad spectrum of psychotic symptoms that may or may not be there. Um, there's a very useful tool that's been widely used in, in mental health services in Headspace uh, called the CALMS, the, the Clinical Assessment of At-Risk Mental State. Um, and that term, at-risk mental state, is increasingly replacing the idea of, of uh, prodromal um, psychosis. And so it's important to look for the range of symptoms. It's important to look for risk factors. In, in the rest of healthcare, we increasingly know to look for family history. If we're looking at someone's risk of skin cancer or, or, or um, you know, other conditions, we, we, it's important to know what their family history is. And that's increasingly the evidence is to support that approach also in psychosis. And look for those other symptom dimensions, not just the, the positive symptoms. Um, Corroborative history is critical and you know, in that scenario you'd be, you'd be keen to talk to his girlfriend Amy, you'd be keen to talk to his parents um, and you'd be really wanting to try and tease out the different possible reasons for his recent decline. Um, some of that might be drug effects, some of that might be depression or some of that might be the, the evolution of an at-risk mental state for psychosis. Um, it's critical as well as identifying that to identify his strengths uh, and his supports and his, uh, his usual strategies for coping. Some of the studies we've done have shown that amphetamine related psychosis have some of the best outcomes um, but that's only true if people stop using um, and uh, so that um, it's really important to not therefore neglect that this really critical opportunity for intervention and that um, you know substance use 
amphetamines and cannabis are one of the few risk factors that you can now mod you know, that you can modify at that point where Andrew has crossed your path in the in the health system. Um, so it's really important to to really focus on assessing and following them up assertively. So I'll um, I'll stop there. Thanks, Grant. That's a really comprehensive overview. And I think there's lots of uh, panel discussion and questions, particularly about the link between uh, schizophrenia and uh, drug-induced um, psychosis and some of the pathways, which we might get you to comment on a little bit later. All right, I'd like to now turn our attention to the primary care response and that of the general practitioner. And so I'll lead you over to Dr. Hester Wilson. Hi. Okay. Um, so I think one of the interesting things for me, having seen people that have used um, stimulants over many years, has, has, has been this sense that uh, things have changed recently, that there is methamphetamine which is more common, which is, which is purer, there's a whole heap of speed up in the media about there being an ice epidemic. And while there has, there is some evidence that perhaps the prevalence of use has increased a little bit, there certainly isn't an epidemic, isn't an epidemic. But one of the things that's interesting is that um, the individuals who are using it are a bit different to the ones that I would have seen in the past. Um, and this is from some work done in 2012. So one of the things about the people that we're seeing and we're seeing them in the primary care setting as well is that they're, they're a slightly different group. And they're a group that wouldn't perhaps think of accessing a special drug and alcohol services. Um, they're more likely to be employed. They see themselves as recreational users. They don't see this as harmful. They don't use as often. Um, and they prefer to see, to, to see GPs or, or self-treat. But the interesting thing is when you look at them, they actually are, are, there are real issues for them in terms of they're quite likely to be dependent. Um, they are using it more um, than they, they think, perhaps. Uh, and, and there is injecting. <laughs> and the people have um, experienced harm as a result of their use. So we've got this, this disconnect between how people see themselves and the harms that they're coming to. And I think that that's one of the things that really drives the whole media frenzy about ICD epidemics is the fact that we are, we are seeing people and it does seem to be more of a problem. The police are talking about it, media are talking about it because the nature of the drug has changed, the nature of the use has changed and the individuals that are using it are a slightly different group. Um, sorry, just changing the page. Um, and we are in, in the primary care setting seeing people to use us. And as I said before, it is one of the issues, this is generally in terms of drug and alcohol use in the primary care setting, is that people don't present saying, I have drug and alcohol problems. They're, they're very likely to come for issues, whether it's a psychological issue, depression, anxiety, fatigue, insomnia, uh, you know, withdrawal, dependence financial issues and personal issues. And so it does, it, it, it's one of the trickinesses for us in general practice to, to go beyond what the person is, is talking about and actually take a, a history that includes a drug and alcohol history to really tease out um, what, what's going on here. Um, now the other really interesting thing I think here is that uh, they, people do come seeking help um, and, and they want to be seen by the GPs, they want to be seen by the our GPs and they report high levels of satisfaction with being treated in the primary care setting. And you can understand this if you're a person who already has a relationship with a general practitioner, if there's a, if there's a therapeutic alliance there already, it's something that we're happy to continue. We are seen as, as the go-to people for, for our patients. Um, and once again, just this is lifting the kind of things that people can present with. Now, in the case that we've got with Andrew, he's presented to the emergency department and as a GP, you might work in a rural regional area where you are, the doctor in the, general, in the emergency department, in which case you will see this. But it's not a common presentation in your uh, surgery or, or um, uh, your, your, your setting in the, in the community. Um, but as I say, it's just much more likely to be other things that they're, that they're having problems with, whether it be um, you know, problems with STI, the bloodborne viruses, the nutrition, um, the, as we said, the psychological stuff, the physical stuff. Um, and, and the other thing is that someone like Andrew, it's likely that they might be seen in the emergency department, things settle down, they're sent home, uh, and they may well be following up with, with us in a general practice setting. 
so that the, the, the role that we have in the general practice setting is following up with them afterwards and supporting them uh, and, and helping them to understand that they do have this risk given the symptoms that they've had and helping them um, to change that. The other thing in terms of us in general practice is that capacity to intervene earlier. So is there a possibility that Andrew might have been seen by a general practitioner that we could have intervened early? Or another really common way that people present in my practice is mum and dad come in or Amy, the girlfriend, comes in and says, I'm really worried, this is what's happening, what do I do? And that's a really important place to intervene. So I just wanted to, from the point of view of um, general practice, just you know, the five A's that we, that we use in general practice, part of a SNAP guide, which is smoking, nutrition, alcohol, and, and um, physical activity, can be applied in terms of how you talk to your patients about this. And this is something that we do in general practice already. So it's not rocket science to do with, with methamphetamine. There may be some aspects of methamphetamine that us in general practice don't have a great deal of experience with, but we can still use the same five A's. I think I'll leave it there. I think I might have talked for long enough. <laughs> Thanks, Hester. That was great in giving us the insight into the complex presentations uh, to a general practitioner that lead to the assessment that you, you know one needs to do. And it really rings through about how complex um, the role is that a general practitioner has to um, undertake. All right, last and certainly not least, I'd like to turn over to Professor Amanda Baker, who's going to talk to us from the perspective of a clinical psychologist. Thanks, Amanda. Hello, everyone. So um, I think what I want to mainly focus on tonight is the importance of the uh, personal relationship in uh, working with people who use methamphetamine. There has been a lot of vilification in the media and I think there's a lot of uncertainty on the part of staff around um, how best to handle the coexisting mental health problems, sometimes the cognitive uh, issues as well as the substance use problem. So methamphetamine is the drug that kind of brings comorbidity together. So it highlights all those issues that are so hard for clinicians. And um, I think it's, it's something that, uh, that we work hard to keep skilled in working with, say, depression, anxiety and substance use. But if you work in drug and alcohol, often you get de-skilled in working in the, with the mental health problems. And conversely, if you're working in a mental health setting, sometimes you you get de-skilled in you know working with substance use. So methamphetamine is the drug that you know really brings comorbidity to the fore, and I think that is why it gets so much publicity from time to time. So the good news is that counselling is very effective uh, when you look at studies in people who are regular methamphetamine users, counselling interventions are effective and they should be in place, of course, in conjunction with needle and syringe programs and HIV antiviral retro, uh, therapy. But it's very important to keep an optimistic um, attitude because we do know, and we've done three randomised control trials in Australia, two um, here in Newcastle and those two trials have shown that um, even two sessions of motivational interviewing and cognitive behaviour therapy can be effective and if you do uh, two sessions of CBT that doubles abstinence compared to the control condition. But if you do four sessions of CBT, if the person can stay as long as four sessions then they'll have additional benefits and those benefits will be in terms of um, reduced depression as well. So the longer someone stays in counselling, the more benefit we tend to see from um, the on the me me um, mental health symptoms. There has been another study done by some uh, people in Adelaide and they compared acceptance and commitment therapy with uh, CBT and they found that CBT was actually more effective than acceptance and commitment therapy in terms of methamphetamine. So um, it's early days, that's only one study, but we have got a gold standard um, therapy here in Australia and that treatment manual from that trial 
is on the Commonwealth website and um, I, I'd urge you to have a look at that and, and use it. So we've done um, a recent randomised control trial with young people who have those uh, early sort of at-risk symptoms, not quite psychosis but some early um, hints of psychotic symptomatology and, and we compared a CBT intervention with uh, reflective listening and uh, people were encouraged to come along for at least eight sessions but they could come along for as many as 24 if they wanted to. And what we found was that the distress associated with the psychotic symptomatology was actually significantly uh, more reduced by the reflective listening approach. So if someone is coming along to you and they're experiencing these symptoms, often the best thing to do is to listen and to show understanding and to use our good clinical skills. And certainly uh, the human relationship is very, very important with methamphetamine use, particularly given their tendency to feel a bit paranoid. So um, the first step is really to use our good counselling skills and then if needed, um, maybe step up to CBT. So there I've got uh, a slide showing what are the good counselling skills, being empathic, compassionate. Often um, there has been some bad press around methamphetamine users, so making them feel as though um, they deserve to be there and to have a good counselling relationship, being respectful of the person and optimistic about change is really important. So brief CBT can work in terms of methamphetamine use, just summarising there. But if you give more sessions in terms of CBT, then you'll have a better effect in terms of mental health symptomatology and overall psychiatric severity. There is a problem with methamphetamine use and relapse, as there is with any uh, drug use. So that um, although we have found that in our counselling trials um, abstinence can be maintained in the longer term, just typically in, in a clinical scenario people tend to weave in and out of drug use, not only with methamphetamine use but alcohol, cannabis and other drugs. So it's not just the one, treat them once and um, people abstain forever. So there needs to be a context either aftercare if someone's been in residential rehab or there needs to be... Um, some sort of mutual aid attendance, whether that's NA or smart recovery or something like that. And um, I think just if you're working in a, an outpatient setting, letting people know that they can come back, whether they're you know, continuing to use or whether they've stopped and you know worried that they'll, they'll use again. So it's very important to help people to improve over the longer term, knowing that you know, it might take... Um, several change attempts before abstinence or significant reduction is reached. So that's it from me. Wonderful. Thanks, Amanda. That was a really uh, a comprehensive overview of the sort of psychological and counselling interventions and I think uh, dovetails quite nicely in some of the medical treatments that we heard about earlier. I just wanted to ask a couple of questions that people from the panel have been asking and some people already asked us previously. And I guess first I'd like to ask uh, either Grant or Adrian to give their perspective about why is it that ice is so addictive? Could you talk a little bit about the sort of biological mechanisms of that? Are you getting a number of questions about that, Adrian or Grant? Sure, I'm happy to start and happy to hear from you too, Grant. Um, there's nothing uh, particularly magical um, about methamphetamine being addictive. Tobacco is probably by far the most addictive um, drug in our country and alcohol is probably not that far behind it. But there's a few things that, that make a drug, I think, used more commonly or more problematically by people in our, our society. So one of them is availability and price is part of availability but if a drug's available then people are more likely to use it. That's why we make it difficult for young people to purchase tobacco for example. The, the thing that we've seen in the last few years and we saw it in the 2000s as well with amphetamine, we saw it in the 1990s with heroin, is if you have a rapid escalation, so there's more availability and purity increases as well, 
then it's, it's a perfect storm for there to be increased use and increased harms related to that. So it was heroin overdoses in the, in the late, mid to late 1990s um, and it's a range of problems including mental health problems related to methamphetamine in the 2010s. Mm. Grant, anything you'd like to add? Look, I mean, I agree that you know, the, the sort of broader social and context issues are probably critical. Uh, the, the pharmacology probably helps. I mean, addictive substances tend to have that um, component of a, a very rapid onset of action and that issue that we've already discussed um, before about the way in which amphetamines, you know, like some other substances, really do uh, tap into the same um, chemical pathways that are involved in our reward systems. Uh, so, you know, it's intrinsically a, a rewarding drug. Mm. Yeah, thanks, thanks, um, Adrian and Grant. That was wonderful. Um, I guess I'd like to now ask Hester. You mentioned earlier some of the sort of presentations that ICE users uh, have in that they're not that they're a certain age group or they're more likely to be employed. Can you tell us a little bit about the types of um, individuals and the comorbidities that you're seeing from a mental health perspective in general practice? Uh, yeah, yeah, in general practice, I mean, uh, certainly we do see people who've had episodes of psychosis and occasionally people will present into general practice. So they'll tend to present into the general practice setting with, with milder symptoms. But the other thing, as I said before, is that we may well see them in follow-up after their presentation in the emergency department. It's particularly in rural regional areas where specialist psych psych psychiatric services um, are thin on the ground, it may be that they are settled down in the emergency department and they come out with their letter from the emergency department to their local medical officer. So we do see people in that in, in that time afterwards. The other, I think the other thing though that we see more commonly is people who are presenting with the high prevalence uh, mental health conditions like anxiety, low mood, depression, but also the interpersonal conflict, so not getting on with family. I mean, I think, uh, as was mentioned before with, uh, with our case study, that he had this, this time of, of, of decline. He, you know, he's an engineering student who's not managing his studies, who's arguing with his family. You know, what is happening there? Is this, is this part of an unfolding mental health issue that he's trying to treat? Uh, with his uh, stimulants because he's used them in the past and they made him feel good. It's a young man who likes to experiment. And so it's, it, it's I think for us in the general practice setting, we're, we're, we're more likely to see people that have the high prevalence conditions like anxiety and depression or just not coping. Uh, you know, so often in the general practice setting we don't get the full blown uh, psychiatric syndrome, but we get people who are not coping, not doing well, not happy, and, that's, and it's really important in that setting to actually dig down and take that drug and alcohol history to assess whether the drug use is, is a contributing factor. Yeah, and, and Hester, and, and I guess I'll open this up to the rest of the panel, there's been a little bit of a discussion about it. What sort of um, numbers of people do you see who have also got ADHD who are presenting and are using methamphetamine? That's an interesting one. Uh, it, it, it is one of the interesting things because, of course, we know that, that ADHD uh, is treated with, with stimulants. Mm. And are there a group of people out there who are actually self-treating their ADHD with a stimulant? Or is it the medicalisation of drug use? Uh, you know, so that people will get a history of uh, something that sounds like ADHD in order to access the drugs. I'd be interested to hear what the other panellists have to say about that. Sure, I'm happy to comment. Um Hester, Adrian here. Uh, so there's around about 110, 120,000 Australians currently prescribed stimulant medication for ADHD. The bulk of those are young people, but maybe a third uh, above the age of 16. Uh, methylphenidate's the most common um, drug prescribed, but dexamphetamine's the second one after that. There's now three controlled trials um, of treating people with stimulant use disorder and ADHD using stimulants, different, different stimulants, but um, dexamphetamine as an example. And um, essentially those trials, so one of them is with methamphetamine, two of them are with cocaine populations. The, there's a consistent result, but in three 
RCT, so we haven't seen it beyond RCTs at this stage, and that's the two things happen. One, people's ADHD gets better. Surprise, surprise, probably not. But secondly, that their stimulant use seems to decrease as well. So it's an area for further exploration, but at this stage, not certainly not at the stage where we should say beyond people with comorbid ADHD and stimulant use disorder to be prescribing that. Now it's a difficult area to diagnose and um, Grant and or Amanda would be interested in your thoughts on that but um, it's, it's, it's a challenging diagnosis to diagnose ADHD in somebody with concurrent stimulant use disorder. Yeah, look, it's Grant here. I, could, I agree with you, Adrian. It is, it is um, extremely challenging and, and, and trying to tease them apart. I mean, there's, there's been certainly some population studies also looking at whether there has been a rise in the prevalence of psychosis associated with, the, with stimulant treatment uh, in, in um, ADHD. Um, and, it, you know, the, the doses that are being used in, in therapeutic treatment are you know, orders of magnitude lower than what people are using in recreational use. And it doesn't appear that, that at those lower doses that there's a, a great increase in risk. Certainly most adult psychiatrists are nervous about, about um, prescribing stimulants. And I think that sort of research you're talking about is really important. But on the whole, it's a sort of subspecialty within adult psychiatry that, that um, some people are willing to and, and, and registered to prescribe stimulants. Um, and the main concern is the, the, you know, the, the, the risk of, of psychosis. And, and you know, for, for people with an established psychotic illness, that's a very real risk. You know, for, for others, that may be less so. Mm. Can I just make a comment, Hester here? I've certainly had a, a small number of patients who I've been treating in the drug and alcohol setting uh, who have been opioid dependent, have a history of like stimulant use, and it becomes clear on the history that it seems like they may have an ADHD that's long standing from childhood into adulthood, and they're, they're really struggling in their lives. And I think it's, it's, I understand that many of the people on this webinar are in, are in the drug and alcohol sector, and it's very easy for us to just come say, well, that's just you. You know, you're, you're, you're like a stimulant user. But in, in this group of people, going through that process and, and getting them assessed by um, two um, consultant psychiatrists and, and for a number of them actually getting on to prescribed stimulant treatment has made a huge difference in their lives. And just because somebody has a, a, like a stimulant disorder doesn't mean that they don't have ADHD as well. And um, I've, I've seen some really good outcomes from that. But it takes a, a very... Um, detailed and, and comprehensive assessment and follow-up and, and also making sure that they're stable in terms of their drug use before proceeding. Mm. Thanks Hester and, and Adrian and Grant. Such an interesting uh, link between methamphetamine use and ADHD which is clearly a complex issue and I think some people are commenting that like a separate webinar on the topic. I just want to turn attention to other comorbidities and, and Amanda if I can come to you. You, you. You've used this great phrase that methamphetamines bring comorbidity to the fore. Can you tell us a little bit about that in the sort of therapeutic session and how a clinician might sort of tease out prioritising treatment, um, presuming you're engaged with someone in a, a, a longer term uh, relationship, how you might tease out what to treat first and what modality? Yeah, so uh, the short answer is it's best to treat the methamphetamine use um, either together with the depression or the methamphetamine use first and then the depression. But if you just treat uh, the depression alone, then um, you have less of an effect on the methamphetamine use. So um, often people will say that, you know, if you give them a choice, which we did in one trial, they'll say they really want to work on their depression. But when you do that, um, you, you'll find that the outcome isn't so good. So it's um, really better to, you know, offer an integrated approach or to, to look at reducing their, their methamphetamine use. Um, sort of, it, you know, just depends on what they they would like to. There's quite a big improvement. It does. There is a delay, and people do have this sort of long-standing uh, time where they experience and cognitive deficits and problems with low mood but there is a big improvement as people reduce so they notice it and they, they you know that it inspires them to come back for more sessions. Mm. 
I guess, I mean, the other thing I would like your opinion about, Amanda, and I'd like to this up to the other panellists also, I think a lot of um, our participants telling us that they're working with young people as young as 12 who are using ICE. And I guess I, I want to um, hear first from you, Amanda, about how you might approach a young person, how that might be different from the treatment approach w with an adult user, and then open up to the rest of the panellists to tell us a little bit about the impact of ICE on the developing adolescent brain and any particular considerations with um, young people and methamphetamine use. Yeah, so um, with our, uh, our child with people at, at risk of um, psychosis, they were aged from, from 12 up and it's really you know, all, you know, very important to establish a good working relationship with people. There's, there's um, no sort of shortcut to that. It's really mm -hmm. about um, them feeling as though they can open up and talk with you and you've got a good relationship with them so that relationship is more important really than than what you do with people and especially mm. with young people they're they're not going to come back unless you know they think they're being understood and listened to and I think a harm reduction approach is very important with young people that um, you know if you go in sort of saying you know they've got to stop using and stop using you know for good then that's not going to go well. Um, you really need to spend time on that relationship and talk with them about reducing their use. And, and uh, I guess I'll ask um, some of our other panellists to comment about generally the sort of use of, uh, the impact of the use of ice on the adolescent brain and treatment considerations when, when working with young people. So I'll, I'll, I might jump in first, um, Catherine. Certainly, yeah, a 12-year-old with methamphetamine use, absolutely, um, there's a very high risk that there's multiple other problems and the methamphetamine use may not even be the most um, sticky one to try to manage. So usually it would need in somebody that young multiple clinicians from multiple backgrounds being involved. Um, in terms of effects on the adolescent brain, um, certainly not something that we'd advise as being a, a good thing. <laughs> There's um, an enormous study going on in the US, the ABCD study, which is scanning thousands um, of young brains serially over a number of years uh, and we'll look probably, they'll see a lot more on, on other drugs like cannabis use than amphetamine use and so in the future we'll know more about it. Um, so not something that can, that's um, advised uh, but not enough yet to say that there's say the neurotoxicity that we might see with alcohol for example. Uh, can, could I add, uh, I agree with Adrian you know, em emphatically that you know, in that the scenario of the 12 year old, you know, you'd certainly be concerned about the range of other issues that, that, that are probably accompanying that. Um, there's very good evidence looking at cannabis that the, the age of first use and, the, and, and particularly use early in adolescence is a really strong um, uh, you know, moderator of the relationship between the cannabis use and psychosis. And I, I haven't seen any studies that have looked at, you know, adolescent, you know, early adolescent amphetamine use in quite that way, um, you know, because it is less common. But, but you would, you know, there'd be every reason to expect that the same would apply. It's really about you know that, that effect on the brain at those earlier and more critical stages of development. Could I just add something as well? It has to hear uh, the issue with the child. So a child definitely under the age of fourteen, and and one of the things that I would be struggling with that, you know, so Amanda saying, hey, you know, you really want to uh, have a harm minimisation approach and create a therapeutic relationship, but at the same time, as a mandatory reporter to our family community services. That is, a, that is a trickiness um, in a way for us and, and you know, it's a little bit easier with the, with the older adolescents but with a child there, we do have that, um, that mandatory reporting uh, issue and, and you're absolutely right that once again it is about, it's, it's quite often the drug use is a symptom of, of much broader things going on in that young person's life. Mm. So I think it's reasonable to say that the, the likely effects of trauma in a 12-year-old who's using a methamphetamine that's likely 
you know, you'd imagine there's likely to be lots of trauma involved. That's going to have a neurotoxic effect and that's going to be probably a long-term uh, problem for that person. Mm. Right. All right. Thanks. I mean, it's complex. Um, I can hear lots of conversation about the need to work in multidisciplinary teams and the need for not only acute care in the hospital setting, as is the case in our case study with Andrew, but really having follow-on with the GP or perhaps vice versa and, and also with clinicians in the community. What are the ways that, um, particularly in remote and rural areas, that drug and alcohol workers or GPs can skill themselves and become more confident in working with individuals who are using methamphetamine? Attend this webinar. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> so so the, ba the basic skills, and, and Amanda, I'd be interested in your, your take on this too, but the basic skills around trying to work with somebody with amphetamine use is no different to alcohol use or tobacco use even, the you know, principles of motivational interviewing and trying to engage people, get them to look at their substance use, get them to look at the harms, get them to identify what they want to do, look at strategies. It's it's not particularly complex, but what people might not feel comfortable or familiar with is the fact that there's a range of other mental health problems that people present with. Uh, but again, there's a spectrum of severity. Not everybody's super complex and super severe. Um, so, you know, we'd encourage people to um, to, to ask their current patients and or clients and uh, and try to engage in conversations about their substance use. The other important thing to remember is there's also a lot of people out there that use methamphetamines that will never have any problems. And I think that, that sometimes we get caught up on, geez, you know, some people do come to harm, but not everybody does. Sometimes it is a recreational drug that many people have fun with and it's not an issue for them. Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think what is challenging potentially is that people present um, fairly in a fairly complex way, even though, as Adrian says, fairly basic counselling really helps a lot. So lots of people, or well, just most people who use methamphetamine use other drugs as well. And if they're experiencing some early sort of psychotic symptomatology, if the clinician isn't confident in handling um, that, then I think, um, you know, people just kind of lack confidence. But like Adrian says, people do tend to respond to, like, a general counselling approach and CBT, which is mainly focused on the drug use. So um, I think it's just the complexity of the presentation is a challenge and um, it's hard to communicate how effective counselling is unless you see that through. And I think a lot of people are just tempted to refer people on. So once again, not everybody is complex. You know, so once again, in the, in the primary care setting, we, we perhaps see a bigger spectrum of people, some of whom their, their drug use is not a problem for them. Um, but I'm coming back to Adrian's point. You know, I know in to, talking to other primary care providers that they're concerned. I don't know very much about our I This is a scary drug. I've seen the, the things on television about people going crazy. But, it, but it, it, the skills that you use are the same as you use to help people adhere to their medication to help them lose weight, maintain the physical or, or improve their physical activity, lose weight, you know, stop smoking. It's, it's the same basic skills there. Uh, and yes, there are some people who are more complex and in the primary care setting, ideally you will have a, have a have connections or have referral pathways so that you can refer onto specialist services that can deal with the more complex um, presentations. Um, and, and that is, I think, one of the real challenges, particularly for people working in rural, regional and remote areas, that g gaining access to those specialist services is, is problematic. Um, there used to be for GPs, there used to be GP psych support where you could actually ring up and, and, and talk to a psychiatrist if you were seeing someone. We don't have that anymore, but we do have DASIS, which, which is the Drug and Alcohol Specialist um, Advice Service. And so as a GP or anybody working um, in New South Wales, and, and there are numbers in other, other um, states as well, just in case the people from the state are listening, uh, where you can actually ring and ask for advice from a drug and alcohol specialist. And that is one way of getting uh, advice quite quickly. It's very responsive service. But there is a real issue around um, how do regional, rural and remote practitioners actually improve their competence and skill up in this area. Mm. 
Great, great. Thanks, Hester. I guess I, I'll put one more question to the panel, and then, we'll, then it will be time to wrap up. I, I, I guess there's been some conversation on the chat about you know the concept of harm minimisation versus drug substitution therapy. Can we have a little bit? Of, could I get your feedback about um, some of the long-term um, proposals therapeutically for individuals using methamphetamine? Adrian, do you want to talk to that Yeah, one? yeah, sure. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, look, uh, certainly in terms of substitution therapy, unlike um, nicotine replacement therapy or buprenorphine or methadone for opiate um, dependence, we don't really have uh, at this stage an evidence-based medication that we can promote for amphetamine dependence. It's one that um, there's clearly a lot of interest in, but the trials to date um, have not have not been promising enough. Um, in terms of, you know, so, so really our, our therapeutic strategies are counselling, counselling and counselling. Um, some people who have high level dependent use need help with stopping the drug, need help with withdrawal. Um, some people need intensive support to be able to stay off the drug, so they need residential um, support as well. In terms of you know promising interventions on the horizon, there's a lot of interest in internet-based or smartphone-based or other other modes of trying to deliver um, counselling. Um, so so that's one. Um, beyond that, you know, it's it's I think still early days. Mm. And I have been trial looking at dexamphetamine and the daffodil. But really, the, the results from the trial aren't good. I mean, there's certainly been some work looking at using those medications in the come down period after a, of a after a amphetamine binge. But once again, not great evidence to support the effectiveness. Mm. Right. That, that, that's really. Um State of, state of the nation as it is with uh, treatment, I guess, at the moment. I guess we've sort of reached the time of night where I'd ask everyone to just give me a little bit of a summary about, um, you know, what they've made of tonight's discussion and some of the take-home messages for our, um, for our participants. I'll start with you, Adrian. So I guess, um, you know, one of the, the, the key issues um, I'm trying to, to get across is uh, clearly there's the potential for mental health complexities, medical complexities, and social, many social problems, and we haven't probably focused on them uh, uh, beyond the, the young person scenario, but there's many social um, problems that can be related to methamphetamine use. But you know, the key thing, I think, for attendees to the webinar would be to encourage them to talk to their patients or clients about substance use. Um, it's, as Hester said, um, a number of times to us, it's not all problematic. They're not all the most severe end of the scale, and certainly her experience in primary care backs that up. Um, so to encourage uh, people to ask their, their clients or their patients about it and uh, offer support. And there's ways of, of, of uh, referring even rural areas. We've talked about the Healthline a couple of times now and uh, suggest people can use that too. All right, I'll, I'll now turn over to you, um, Grant. Can you give us a bit of a summary about the um, main messages in your presentation tonight and what you've heard? Look, I, I think yeah, I've enjoyed listening to the other um, panellists and you know, to me there's a, com a kind of common theme through a number of the presentations that uh, even though there are some specific things around amphetamines, a lot of the approach is really shared you know, broadly. It's, a, it's about good engagement with the person, um, uh, good, good assessment, you know, trying to maintain a relationship and that really challenging kind of um, you know, magical part of, of any treatment which is about trying to motivate people and find the things that help people want to change. And 
and, and make sensible decisions for themselves. And it's really a challenge in young people with psychosis, but it's really a challenge for everyone. So, um, and uh, you know, the, the main take-home message for me, I guess, would be to think broadly about psychosis as a spectrum of disorders, and and to be really thinking as we would with, you know, with, with skin cancer, about what's your personal range of risk factors, including your family history. Mm. Such an important message and so so well expressed, Grant. I really like that. And and with the um, diagram you gave of that, something I'm going to certainly take away. Like that. And and with the um, diagram you gave of that, something I'm going to certainly take away from this. All right, um, Hester, can you tell us a little bit about your um, you know take home messages that you'd like the participants in tonight's um, webinar to be left with? Yeah, I think there's three three parts to it for me. That there's a really important part of that non-judgmental approach, uh, and and really going to where the person is seeing where they're at. They may not actually want to stop using, but you want to engage with them and make an assessment around. Well, is there use a problem? Is it causing them problems? Is it causing the family problems? Is there some way you can actually intervene and assist? Uh, in order to uh, re reduce their risk and, and minimise their harm. And also that, that thing, and it's particularly an advantage we have in primary care, that we see people over a period of time, you know, long term, many of my patients I've been seeing for longer than I would care to uh, give my age away. Um, so there's that, that ability to have that ongoing engagement. You know, you, I, I'm, I'm hear, hearing that you're having these issues, I'm hearing that you're using this, this, um, this drug, I'm concerned for you, I want you to be well. Please come and see me when you're ready. Please, you know, I, I do want to assist you. And, and keep the door open uh, and be ready to uh, intervene and support and refer as needed when, when, when the person's ready. Mm. All right. Thanks, Hester. That's wonderful. Um, and finally, over to you, Amanda. Can you tell us a bit of your um, summary and take-home messages from tonight's webinar? Okay. So... The most important messages I think I've heard tonight from the panel are that um, most people who use methamphetamine don't experience problems with it. If they do experience problems, then, like Adrian said, counselling, counselling, counselling <laughs> can help. So do keep that in mind. Um, I think it's really important to have some optimism around that. We know it works and give it a go. Mm. Thanks, Amanda. That is an optimistic and hopeful message for us all. And I think hearing all of you, um, that convergence of sort of medical, social, psychological, overall health perspective and really person-focused treatment, um, the onus is on all of us as clinicians and experts in various areas to um, work collaboratively with one another with methamphetamine, people who are using methamphetamine particularly with the um, comor comorbidities that are brought to the fore, as you say, Amanda. Um, so I would you know, spectacularly like to thank all of you for your expertise and uh, input on tonight's webinar. From my perspective, it's been fantastic. I can see that our um, participants have enjoyed your informative presentations and response to the case. There's lots of questions that um, many of you are being asked about specific uh, niche areas based on people's experiences and what they would um, like to do. So thank you again and thank you to our wonderful participants for your encouraging comments, for your uh, uh, productive and useful comments and for the questions and interest you've shown in the topic. Um, the webinar, as you know, has been made possible through funding provided by the New South Wales Ministry of Health. We would encourage you to fill out the exit survey before you log out. It will appear on your screen after the session closes and certificates for attendance for this webinar will be issued within two weeks. Um, and you will all be sent a link to the online resources which are associated with this webinar within one week. So again, please fill out the exit survey and you will be receiving um, those re resources. I'd also like to uh, tell you about an upcoming webinar. Um, the Department of Veterans Affairs has engaged MHPN to produce a series of six webinars focused on supporting the mental health of veterans. The first webinar in the series, Understanding the Military Experience from Warrior to Civilian, will be held on Tuesday the 16th of August. Um, I'd also like to encourage you, based on some of the discussions and questions that have come up tonight, to consider setting up your own special interest network 
or to enjoy, join an existing one where there is one in your area. And uh, finally, before I close, I'd like to acknowledge the consumers and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. Thank you again to everyone for your participation and contribution.